From thence, you shall go to a place of execution for this county, where you will be hung until you be dead. And may God have mercy upon your souls. I'd like to warmly welcome you all to the 400th anniversary of the Pendlewick Stories. My name is Thomas. I shall be your guide for the day, relaying to you all the stories associated with the 1612 trials of the Pendle Witches. If there's any questions you'd like to ask, if you feel confused about anything I've said, then don't hesitate to interrupt me. Right, are we all ready? Hang on, Tom, we're one shot over here. Rebecca! Come on! As I mentioned before, we're here to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the Pendle Witch story. Let's see now. There was Anne Whittle, Elizabeth Device, and a lady called Alice Nutter. In fact, rumour has it, there are a few nutters in the area that like to think they're actually related. Uh, you know, actually, Tom, I was wondering if we could perhaps start with the story of the Somsbury Witch Trial. Uh, I don't know about the rest of the group, but I've not really heard much discussed on that topic. Well, I suppose there's no harm in deviating from the script. They were all acquitted, which makes their story perhaps not as well publicised as that of the Pendlewitches. But I can assure you, the crimes they committed were just as horrendous as the Pendlewitches. Well, as long as it's not too horrible for young ears. Isn't that right, Rebecca? It was the testimony of a child witness that was key to the prosecution. It was quite common for that period of time to use children in courts as witnesses. The witness was called Grace Sarbots, the daughter of a Thomas Sarbots, a local husbandman. She accused one of them, her grandmother, Jeanette Brearley, and also her niece, Ellen Brearley, along with another woman called Jane Southworth. These three stood accused of witchcraft. <laughs> child. I was most fearful. It was cold and dark and I had no cause to scream for being heard by it. The monster that is, the black dog, my grandmother, it was stalking around on its hind legs calling out to me. This is absurd. What has possessed you to do this? How could you? Quiet down this instant. It called upon me to drown myself. She accused her own grandmother? Yes, she did. There's a similarity between black dogs and the Pendle Witch story, but Grace also claimed this same black dog had tried to bury her 
under a blanket of straw. And that black dog was none other than her own grandmother who had changed into a different form. It buried me in the hay out near the old Walshman place until I couldn't see through the hay. And then I felt it lay down on me and start pressing on me until... until... It all went cold and dark. <laughs> That's ridiculous. She also accused them of something by far more sinister. The death and mutilation of a baby belonging to none other than Mr. Thomas Walshman. It was said by Grace that the three women were led by Jane at night to the home of Thomas Walshman. This house was probably quite isolated, leading the women to be able to move freely under the cover of darkness. Grace's horror, they proceeded to go about this most gruesome of rituals, first stabbing the child with a long nail through the abdomen. and then between the three of them, continuing to drink the blood fresh from the wound, while Grace could do nothing but simply watch. The child was then placed back at the side of the still sleeping parents for them to make their tragic discovery upon waking. Remember what I said? This was simply the testimony of young Grace. Yes, the baby did die, but sometime afterwards and not necessarily connected to this action. Go on, Tom. What happened next? Well, we went back for the baby to Salmsbury Church at night so we wouldn't be seen. It was black as pitch and the moon kept vanishing behind the clouds so I couldn't see. They were digging up the body and they were all scrabbling down in the dirt and they kept looking at me and I didn't want nothing to do with that, sir. grandmother's house. They boiled it up. They broiled bits. So the bones simmered upon the hob. The women told the terrified young Grace that with the fats from the baby's flesh they would make ointments that would enable them to change their shape in the form of the black dog persona. And they took the bones to make fancy ointments that they said would transform people, magical things to turn people into monsters. Lies. These are all lies. Ludicrous. What utter nonsense. Please, Jane, tell them. Say something. Please, God, stop this absurdity. Enough of this display. 
thought of you. Did you partake in this twisted ceremony? No. No, sir, no. I... Not at all. I don't believe in no cannibalism, sir. This is ridiculous. Exhumed corpses, unconfirmed murders, and all this fanciful stuff about potions and metamorphoses. Do these people have no sense to laugh off a child's storytelling? You have to take into account, my dear, the era. At that period of time, people wrapped up in a fear uh, not too dissimilar to today's fear relating to modern day terrorism. You seem very quick to jump to the defence of these witches. You seem quick to label them witches and presume good. I mean, it's not as if all this was made up. Things clearly happened and people were clearly involved. It turns out that young Grace had even more sinister tales. We met every week on Sunday and Thursdays, mostly. There was this place we went to, you see, on the north side of the Ribble Cod. Red Bank, it was called. There we found these creatures. Grace mentioned the meetings these women had with four black things going upright, yet not like men in the face, but given the presence of devilish demonic features. It's said they danced together, they then paired off for a meal, and sexual contact took place with these demonic spectres. Then the creatures Suffered to pull us to the ground. And then they abused our bodies. Whose words are these, Grace? How horrific. See? So you expect someone so young to make up something like that, do you? <laughs> I just know better than to believe everything that comes out of the mouth of a child. Come on. Really? You're serious, aren't you? These women must have been terrified, the poor souls. They pleaded with the judge to examine this testimony, and this process was started by a strong, confident woman, Jane Sanders. Enough of your foolishness, little girl. I am tired of pandering to your little display. You've wasted enough time already. We have a right to defend ourselves against this ridiculous barrage of lies. I would warn you to know your place. Would it interest the court to know the true narrator of this fanciful piece? And what, the court just listened to this after all they'd been told? The stories they heard were very, very harrowing and somewhat similar to the prosecuted Pendle witches. All these images, all these anecdotal stories, the women were clearly innocent. But why? How on earth could a child make up such terrible things? More to the point, why would a child make up these things? You can't possibly believe this. Greater story, witchcraft. A child died, witches or not, something happened. There's nothing to suggest that the baby died as a result of these actions. But what we do know is the three women insisted that Grace be cross-examined. Then let me draw your attentions to the young girl's tutor a manipulative deviant and a Catholic, one whom I myself am quite familiar with. I have seen this priest, one whom many of you may have heard reference to as Thompson. He has been regaling young Grace these past few weeks with obvious lies, all while she was under his religious tutelage at Salmsbury Hall. I also feel that I should reveal that I know this man as Christopher Southworth. I am in no doubt that he has trained her for this very act with the desire to see us unjustly sentenced as witches before this court. We cannot, could not do any of these atrocious crimes. 
believers, we are innocent. These are lies. All lies. To understand this revelation, we need to go back to the 16th century at the time of the English Reformation. That's when the Church of England severed all links with the Pope and Rome. The Southworth family was split, but Sir John was still a staunch Catholic. It said he didn't like Jane at all because she was the Protestant wife of his grandson John, the sole heir to Salisbury Hall. I was wondering where this Jane came into things. So this was a plan to get rid of her because of her Protestant beliefs. John never ever liked Jane. In fact, he quarrelled many, many times with his son about her actions. I'm sick of these conversations, Grandfather. I will not let my emotions be ruled by your eccentric religious concerns and outdated opinions on our family ties. I mean, I wish to marry this girl. But you can't. Can't you see what she's doing to you? She's corrupting your mind. She's filling your head with heresy and betrayal of the one true religion. And I fear for you and your very soul. This is maddening, and I won't listen any longer. How can you not see how sincerely narrow-minded your views are? Your dislike for her is completely unfounded, and you try to tie this family together with your outdated Catholic views, which is giving us a bad name. Listen to me, my boy. Your devotions to your faith have wavered in the last few years, and I no longer hear you at prayer. Christopher tells me that there are rumours in town about carnal betrayal and much, much worse. You know that I have heard these things before and you must have also. Will you finish, Grandfather? Yes. Yes, of course. Sir John Southworth died in the year 1595. Christopher Southworth took up the mantle of the Catholic voice within the family. Also, Jane married John Southworth Jr. in 1598, and they both lived in Salisbury Lower Hall. So this elder John and Christopher didn't like Jane. Is that all? Remember what I said about religion in those days? Christopher uh, was a proud member of the family, and his heretical faith meant that he really didn't trust Jane in the slightest because of her Protestant and Anglican beliefs. But there seems to be a much more grimmer uh, salient point to this. What does she do? Well, John did die of an unknown illness. We don't know for certain, but uh, Jane certainly was looked on as a witch. She would carry favour with local men and was not popular within the Southworth household. You asked to meet with me? I have asked you here to discuss these troubled stories of yours. I'm not impressed with your accusations, my dearest Christopher. They do not shed me in a good light. A witch, Christopher. A witch. Of all things you choose, a witch. You'll be seen for what you are. Not my words. You'll be found out. And I will have my justice. Your justice? You speak with such grandeur for such a little man cowering in the shadows. Your justice is nothing and your court is not recognised. My justice will speak louder than your wretched lies, you Protestant witch. My family will regain the honour that you took. And we will see you tried for what you've done. Still hold me responsible for the death of John, do you? You call yourself a priest, but you are not a man of God. You are simply a bitter relic of a fallen family, and I will have no part in your childish game. I will see you tried for what you've done. I will see you punished. It would behove you, troublesome Christopher, to remember we are not all without our secrets. Not all safe from watching eyes. You wait. What's that? Thompson? So because they couldn't prove that Jane murdered John, they set the whole thing up? I still don't think we should jump to the conclusion that she was innocent. I mean, she could have poisoned him or, I don't know, something like that. Uh, you could be both right, really. It's maybe in a desire from the South of family to see Jane punished that may have brought this forward. I ask again for you to acknowledge our innocence and allow us to go free. In light of 
a lack of evidence against you. I now accept your innocence and lack of part in any undertaking of witchcraft. So the three women were found innocent then? They were acquitted? Yes, uh, Judge Bromley found them innocent of the crimes against them. Oh, thank you. Thank you kindly. I'm in no doubt that the publicity surrounding the Pendle Witch Trials gave Christopher Southworth the motive and the encouragement to instruct his witness against these three women. An impudent wench delivering a strangely devised accusation. Rebecca, that's enough! Come over here now, we're leaving! <laughs>